Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be, be here introducing this, this panel on the Puranas. The Puranas are a vast uh, compendia of texts. The earliest ones probably from 5th century CE or so, and I, I think almost, perhaps they're almost still being composed. I'm not sure. Um, and for me, as a sort of rather dry textual scholar, they're rather daunting because they are these, these huge, huge compendia with all kinds of different texts and all kinds of different topics and so forth. And I occasionally uh, turn to them for my research work, but not very often. As I say, they're, they're slightly off-putting for, for dry textual scholars like me. So I'm delighted to have two uh, more sort of rassica aficionados and of, 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 these, of these texts here to... Uh, to plunge their, plumb their depths and, and uh, extract the Amrita and tell us uh, about their, the, the great pleasures uh, concealed within. Now, I'm not going to give a full introduction to either of them because their biographies and achievements and areas of expertise are so huge and varied that actually they look a bit like the, the contents of the Puranas themselves. And uh, so without further ado, I shall hand over to Bibek Debroy and Pushpesh Pant. So Bibek, perhaps you'd, you'd like to go first. Thank you, Jim, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I think before we begin to talk about the Puranas, we need to pin down and explain what we mean by the Puranas. Or certainly, I want to pin down and explain what I mean by the Puranas. The Puranas, etymologically, the word simply means ancient, ancient accounts. And the Puranas are clubbed together with what is referred to as Itihasa, by which one means the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. So the Puranas are in conjunction, are in continuation of partly the Ramayana and certainly the Mahabharata because Veda Vyasa is believed to have composed the Puranas. There are major Puranas, there are minor Puranas, there are things that are known as Thala Puranas which are associated with particular geographical locations. When I'm using the word Purana, I'm using it in the sense of the Mahapuranas. Because the Upa Puranas, the minor Puranas, also the listing varies from one part of the country to another. Whereas when man is talking about the Mahapuranas, and there are 18 of those Mahapuranas, the list is reasonably consistent. The Mahapuranas, as Jim suggested, also vary enormously in length. Together, the 18 Mahapuranas amount to about 400,000 shlokas. To give you some idea of what that means in terms of magnitude, that's four times the size of the Mahabharata. Out of these 18 Mahapuranas, some of them are shorter, 10,000 shlokas, 12,000 shlokas. The two longest ones are the Skanda Purana, which is the longest at almost 80,000 shlokas and the Padma Purana which is at around 50,000 shlokas. There are different texts of all of these for the Ramayana. We have a critical text now thanks to the Baroda Institute. For the Mahabharata we also have a critical text thanks to the Bandarkar Institute. For the Puranas there is no such critical text. Subjectively, I think that the Ninnai Sagar edition is probably the best text that you have of the Puranas. Last sentence, the Puranas are supposed to have five different characteristics. Pancha Lakshana, the original creation, Sarga, the periodic processes of creation and destruction, Prati Sarga, the different eras named after the Manus, the Manvantaras, the history of the creation of the gods and the rishis, and the history of the royal dynasties, particularly the Surya Vansha and the Chandra Vansha. So these are the five characteristics. The Puranas also have a lot of geographical material, and many of our rituals originate in the Puranas.
good morning once again. And I have no claims to either scholarship or to historicity of Puranas. I have a very personal relationship with Puranas, so I probably would qualify as a half-hearted Rasik at least. Um, my earliest memories of Puranas are that when somebody died in Uttarakhand, after the funeral rites, there was a ritual recitation of Shiv Purana or Linga Purana. And I wasn't quite sure as a child growing up whether these texts were scriptures, they were prescribed ritual, or they were just post-funeral entertainment to normalize the family, uh, ensuring them that the departed soul had reached heavens, not the hell, and that's it. But the, the other part is that even today, the tradition of recitation in vernacular, part Kumauni, part Hindi, of a Puran like Bhagavat Puran is a ritual which is performed regularly that the Kathavachak observes so fast, the listeners observe rites of purity, they sit together and listen. Now my problem with Puran is, as he said, the authenticity of the text, the standard edition, proper translation are given a go by. And people go by the storytelling which the Pur Puranic is giving for the Bhagavat Puran, Shiv Puran, Ling Puran, whatever it is. And mostly these are Hindi translations of Gita Press Gorakhpur. Now Gita Press Gorakhpur is not the flavor of the month for secular democratic India. But I think what they have done through Kalyan and other things, they are the ones who have carried Purans to the average Indian household. That's one. My second confusion about Purans always is, uh, in, in Hindi, at least, Puran is used, the term, not strictly in a scholarly fashion, not as Itihas, not as Pancham Ved, but as something, a, a little excessively long, boring tale. If you get into a conversational mode, they would say, ye kaun sa Puran shuru kar diya tumne? Ye Puran khatam kab hone wala hai? And of course, there is an implication, another derogatory implication, that you are an obscurantist if you are dealing with some Puranic material, or ye to Puranic hai. I think for the average man or woman, to be gender correct, gender correct, no bias, it is Puran's perennial appeal arises because they blur boundaries. They blur boundaries between history and mythology. They blur boundaries between genealogy, chronology, cosmology, and why not for good measure a little bit of uh, pornography. Like uh, the, what you couldn't, what was, what is not accessible to you as the Trithiya Sarg in Kumar Sambhav perhaps, in, in the Puran the condensed version of the eroticism is brought in there. That would please uh, Wendy Dollinger no end, but Purans would also have a fairly interesting um, entertainment value also. So as Vibhikta has rightly put it, is a bit of an encyclopedia, a bit of history, but I think for most people it is everything all put together in one. But something which I have never been able to answer for myself, and I look forward to this conversation this morning to edify myself, is that <clears throat> why is so much fold back from one Puran to another Puran necessary? And why should there be, as you rightly said, there is so much geographical information, uh, Sthal Puran or whatever it is. But why do you always begin the story, Ekada Namisha Ranya Munaya Shonakadaya, and then the tale goes into um, expanding concentric circles. What starts from Nimisharani ends up maybe in the foothills of Tarai in Bengal. It heads towards northwest frontier. They, it would go towards Dandakarani in central India and so on. But all these stories and all these geographical references are there in your brilliantly translated 12 volumes of Mahabharata and the Harivansha. So why is it necessary to retell the tale? Is it for recasting the text for each generation differently? Uh, is that necessary? Uh, or who decides? I mean, I think one thing in your earlier translation of uh, Puranas, which you said was a bad translation, you were promising us a much better translation. But for me, that even that bad translation was brilliant because it explained to me what Puranas were. And you have another very nice bit in the introduction where you say some Puranas are Satvik, some are Rajsik, some are Tamsik. So how are some categorized with the same textual material as Satvik, some Rajsik, some Tamsik? Who decides what are major Puranas and minor Puranas? <clears throat> well, the Puranas themselves have a listing of the 18 major Puranas. There are marginal differences, but by and large there is consistency. The only inconsistency, and one is getting a little bit into nitty-gritty detail now, is whether in that list of 18, you include the Shiva Purana or whether you include the Vayu Purana. If you don't include both, 
then sometimes they are substituted by the Bhavishya Purana, which of course is of much later vintage. If one is talking about the Mahapuranas, as Jim said, he suggested a date, there's no point quibbling about the date, I would probably say something like 3rd century to 10th century, something like that. That's broadly the range. What clearly probably happened, and I'm just talking about the Mahapuranas now, what probably clearly happened was that there was an original Purana text, which in the course of history, in the course of oral transmission, has got lost. And so therefore in this process of hearing and retelling, there were embellishments and additions. Pushpesh alluded to a division that is drawn across these 18 Mahapuranas. Six of them are identified with Brahma, six are identified with Vishnu, six are identified with Shiva. This is partly an artificial silo kind of thing because I mentioned the Pancha Lakshanas. Any Purana which tends to emphasize stories of creation more is identified with Brahma. And in many of these Puranas, for the same story, depending on whether Vishnu is relatively more important in that text, the same story will have a relatively greater degree of superiority associated with it, Vishnu. And there are others where, for the same story, Shiva will get, get prominence. So that is that artificial distinction between the Shiva type of Puranas and the Vishnu type of Puranas. The Puranas, there is a lot of geography in the Mahabharata and the Ramayana actually. The Valmiki Ramayana, the geography is more north to south. The Mahabharata geography is more east to west. But many of these Puranas add to that and some of them are detailed descriptions of geography. There are detailed genealogies also. For example, suppose I want to date the Kurukshetra war. I'm not getting into issues of whether it happened or did not happen. I just want to date it from the accession of Parikshet. The Mahabharata gives me no information. It is the genealogy lists in the Puranas which give me a period of 1050 years or 1015 years, depending on which text I'm going to use, to date from Parikshit to the accession of Mahapadma Nanda, which is an externally validated historical incident. Amongst the Puranas, there are some that are constantly read. The Bhagavat Purana you mentioned, that's probably the one that's read most. There are others we read without necessarily realizing that they are the part of the Purana. From the, for example, the eastern parts of India, Chandi is read quite a lot. A lot of people don't realize that the Chandi section is from the Markandeya Purana. And the way the Markandeya Purana begins is extremely interesting. Because in the Mahabharata war, there is Arjuna who is fighting with King Bhagavat Bhagavatta. And King, King Bhagavad Datta has a huge gigantic elephant which has a gigantic bell slung around its neck. So the elephant is killed, the bell falls down and there were four birds. Those four birds were still inside the eggs. The Kurukshetra war was raging all around them. The birds would not have survived but for the fact that the bell fell on them, covered them, and hence the birds begin to impart their wisdom to the sage Markandeya. That's how the Markandeya Puran starts, of which Chandi is one part. Then there are things, for example, associated with funeral ceremonies, rituals we observe. Where do those come from? Gadur Purana, without our necessarily realizing that is in the Gadur Purana. Some of prognosis, future forecasts, Vashtu Sastra, the iconography of images, where does it come from? It comes from the Agni Purana, except we don't realize it's from the Agni Purana. 
So in that sense, there is a lot that is in the Puranas, much more than in the Mahabharata, which influences our daily practices and rituals. I would just like to ask you one more question. Uh, would you like to add something about the regional Puranas? Like in Tamil Nadu, you would have Periya Puranam. And the word Purana would say that it is laying claims to the Puranic text status. Does it fulfill the Panchalakshanas? What is the relationship between these regional Puranas? Or the, uh, to, be, to be more precise, would you like to comment on the relationship between Uppuranas and Mahapuranas? Do they add a sufficiently valuable quantum of uh, additional information, geographical, ritualistic, historical, lexographical, genealogical, to the Mahapuran text to make them useful? and make the list permutation combinations necessary uh, depending on your requirements. Pushpesh, you are dragging me into very dangerous territory. Uh, in a sense, much of what is in texts of Hinduism, the distillation of that is reflected in the Puranas because that's what the Puranas were meant to be. That how can many people necessarily be immersed and imbibe Vedanta? Let them try and learn that through the Puranas. The Mahapurana, strictly speaking, all have that process of distillation. But there was a tradition that was somewhat different. That is the tradition of Agama, Tantra, all of that. Some of these Upapuranas actually incorporate them into the corpus by expanding it. So the Upapuranas, as I said, they vary enormously from one part of the country to another part of the country. They don't necessarily stick to the Panchalakshana except in a very mechanical kind of sense, almost per force one would have to do that. Having done that, for example, you take something like the Devi Purana. The Devi Purana would build on what is there in the Markandeya Purana, but much of the worship of Devi, or much of the worship of Shakti, draws on the Devi Purana today, or the Kalika Purana today, rather than the Markandeya Purana. There is no essential conflict. So all of that Agama literature, which was slightly different, the Tantra, all of that was brought in. The Upapuranas often tend to glorify particular parts of the country, which is why I said that the list of Upapuranas varies. The list of Mahapuranas is more or less constant. So you will find minor variations, let's say, in the Skanda Purana, which will extol Purushottam Shetra Uri a little bit more, or something will extol Ujjaini a little bit more. But fundamentally, the text is very, very similar. I'm happy to ask you one more question. I mean, most of these Mahapuranas and Upuranas are anonymous, but there is a tradition of Jain writers writing Puranas which identify the author. And these are neither Agam nor Tantric tradition nor the distilled descents of Hinduism. So what is the correspondence, the correlation between this Puranic texts and the Mahabharata? You know, this one, Pushpesh, I will duck. I will duck for the very simple reason, not because it's an inconvenient question, but because I have not read the Jaina Puranas. But you are absolutely correct and I am glad you mentioned it. Because there are Jaina Puranas which presumably have a slightly different kind of take on even the genealogies. But because I have not read them, I won't comment on those. Just to, if I could add a little comment now, I was just wondering if, so if you're, I don't know about these Jain Puranas with, with uh, human authors ascribed to them, but I was wondering if maybe on that note you might address the relationship between Puranas and history, whether, whether you think, because presumably if they've got human authorship then perhaps that locates them in time and place and and they have a perhaps closer relationship to real and history. And that probably freezes the text and other people coming later have only an opportunity of adding a commentary. No, I, I would react to it, it's, it's a continuation of what I said earlier, that if I want to date the Kurukshetra war, I want to date the accession of Parikshit. The Puranas are the only thing that I can depend on. Unfortunately, there has been an impression that all of these are myths 
There is no kernel of truth in them, be it from the point of view of history or be it from the point of view of geography. So apart from the odd person, person like Parjitar or Pusalkar, I don't think anyone has really systematically scholarly, and I'm looking at you now, Jim, that this is something that Swas should do. Someone has systematically tried to look at this with an objective eye rather than dismissing it and saying all of this is myth. Because the genealogy lists are, there may be some extrapolation, there always are, there are embellishments, but the genealogy lists, they ring true. The geographical descriptions, they also ring true. And therefore, there is this wealth of literature. Um, would you care to comment about the larger cultural impact of the Puranas uh, in different art forms? You know, you come across odd references to this Bharatanatyam pose comes from a pur description in Puranic text. But then most of this dance thing would be from sculpture, also uh, reinforced from temples and so on. You would have miniature paintings which would be depicting a Bhagavat episode or something like that. So what kind of a role has had the Puranas played in the creative imagination and expression in different art forms in India. You see, look, there's a huge corpus, and this huge corpus cuts across all kinds of different streams. We've got the Vedas, the Sanghitas, we've got the Brahmanas, we've got the Aranyakas, we've got the Upanishads, we've got the Vedangas, the six Vedangas, which are an integral part of all this. There are the Dharma Shastras. The Ramayana, the Mahabharata, the Puranas that we are talking about. And then you have the tradition of, let us say, Natya Shastra. Chanda, Natya Shastra, they are intricately linked. So the question, your question is really linked to Natya Shastra. But the Natya Shastra flows naturally from whatever is there about this in something like the Agni Purana. So they are all, they are not different silos sitting there in isolation. This one spills over into another. So Chanda Shastra, for example, is closely linked to Natya Shastra. And at one point in time, a person who was learned was skilled across all of these. It is not that I specialized in A, B, or C. In our conversation, we have lost track of one question which I had raised earlier, which I'm looking forward to now that you are here with us. How do we decide that which of the Purans is Sattvic, Rajasik, and Tamasik, and why? Um, oh, you know, I said that these are partly artificial. The ones that are identified with Brahma are often classified as Sattvic. The ones that are identified with Vishnu are often classified as Rajasik. The ones that are identified with Shiva are often classified as Tamasik. But I think this is somewhat artificial because the Swatik elements, the Rajasik elements, the Tamasik elements, they cut across all the Puranas. All of them. For example, let us take goddesses. Goddesses are likely to figure much more in Puranas that are identified with Shiva than those that are identified with Vishnu. Tantra, Agama, they are likely to figure much more in Puranas that are identified with Shiva. But this Swatik, Rajasik, Tamasik, yes, we do tend to classify them like that, but I find at the end of it all that this is somewhat artificial, as is the Brahma, Shiva, Vishnu. Um, just, just to go, just to pick up on you suggesting that uh, I, at SOAS we, we start working on the, on, on the Puranas. I just, uh, I'm not, I don't know if you know about the, uh, the Leiden Skanda Purana editing project. And just to give you some idea of, just to give the audience some idea of the, uh, the, 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 the hugeness, the difficulty of working on these texts. There's the, the Skanda Purana is the biggest, as you said, and, and perhaps one of the oldest uh, or the oldest Purana. And there's, a, there was a, a, there's a, a manuscript of it from Nepal dated to 810, okay, which was uh, reproduced by a scholar called Bhattarai about four, 50 years ago. I'm, I'm not quite sure about that. Anyway, there's since been a project started at Leiden University in Holland by Professor Hans Bakker, which was started about 35 years ago. And I think they're about 
a quarter of the way through. He's just recently realized, I saw him, and he's kind of realized that he's not going to live to see the end of it because these, you know, the text is so huge. There are so many manuscripts, and it's so complicated to try and work out what the oldest bits are and what the new bits are that have, that have been uh, incorporated. That uh, I'm not trying brave enough. I've got uh, other work going. I'm not trying brave enough to start a Piranha project of my own. Uh, but just to, uh, having said that, I, w I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about, but both of you, about the Bhagavata Purana, which I find particularly interesting. It seems r rather anomalous from my sort of rather meager understanding of Puranas. It's written in a much higher register of Sanskrit. It seems to be a much more coherent text that doesn't have different layers to it and so forth. So I'm wondering if you could, if, if you, if you could tell us something about how it was produced and also why it, I think its popularity certainly exceeds that of, of all the other Puranas. Uh, sorry, this is a long question as well because I know that we uh, these Bhagavat Katas and so forth. It's it's very it's used a great deal in uh, in ritual performance. Ah, I mean you were, I think you were mentioning a Kumau and there are other ritual performances of uh, Puranas, but are, are others also used in in such a way? So sorry, that's a long question. So Bhagavata uh, Purana and then other are other Puranas used in in ritual um, performance? Well, before that, just so that you have a sense of what Jim is talking about. The Bhandarkar Mahabharata project, the critical edition, it took about 50 years to produce. And essentially what one did there, and I presume something similar would be done here also for the Skanda Purana, is you sit down with all of these texts and do a little bit like what in school we used to call a HCF, which is if a shloka occurs across most of those texts, then I regard that as in some sense an authentic shloka. The Ramayana project used a slightly different approach, but that's essentially the idea. I think, see if one looks at the structure, if one uses the Pancha Lakshana, I think the Purana that fits the Pancha Lakshana best, I'm not saying that that's an in, infallible criterion, but the Purana that fits the Panchalakshana criteria the best is probably the Vishnu Purana. The shorter the Purana, typically the more coherent its style tends to be. So what you said about the Bhagavad Purana, all right, maybe, but that would probably be equally true of something like the Brahma Purana. But the moment it becomes the Padma Purana or the Skanda Purana, it's all over the place in terms of the style. Now, so far as the Bhagavad Purana is concerned, the reason for the Bhagavad Purana being important, and it's not just the Bhagavad Purana, it is particularly the 10th Skanda. I think it became, I'm guessing, but I think it became so very popular because of the spread of Vaishnavism. And it was also largely popularized because of Sri Chaitanya. And some people here may not know that Sri Chaitanya was a great Sanskrit scholar amongst other things. He was not just the leader of a bhakti movement or an incarnation of Krishna. He was a great Sanskrit scholar. And yes, you're absolutely right. The Bhagavad Purana is read the most. And that, I think, is because of the Vaishnava kind of influence. Whereas, if you look at any of the other Puranas, it's one thing to say that my funeral ceremonies are influenced by the Garura Purana. But that apart, there is no particular reason why I should read it all the time on a daily basis. The only exception to that rule, other than the Bhagavad Purana, would probably be Chandi, which our president also reads continuously. That, as I said, is from the Markande Purana, but these two are the ones which are continuously read, I think. The relative popularity of the Puranas may also have something to do with either the familiarity and the easy access a text allows, or the exotic element in it which makes it a little more attractive. Like, for instance, if you, you mentioned the ritual recitation of Puranas, which I had referred to, uh, for Funeral ceremonies, that would be Shiv Puran, Garud Puran, Ling Puran. But for each auspicious occasion, it, the conclusion would be a Bhagavad Puran. And Bhagavad Puran would be a long-winded Puran compared to a shorter, more coherent Puran. But it would also allow a larger audience to have a cafeteria approach and get from that Puran whatever 
they wish to get on a different day. Uh, but I have a question for you, Vigda, is like this, that would you say that Puranas represent the distilled essence of Hindu Indic civilization better than any other text because Vedas are metaphysical, Upanishads, Vedas are metaphysical, Dharma Shastras are codes of conduct, uh, the epics are akhyans and narratives, Puranas have everything. So if you wanted to get the flavor of the diversity and dis different distributaries and contributaries to the mainstream, if there is a mainstream or different mainstreams from, uh, you know, that w wouldn't that be uh, the uh, correct way to say that Purans give us a window into the Indian mind? I'll, I'll agree with that with a slight modification you see, the Mahabharata, there is a perception about what the Mahabharata represents. And there is a reality about what the Mahabharata has. Now, in terms of what the Mahabharata has, not the perception, the Mahabharata also has many of these characteristics that you are uh, ascribing to the Puranas, except that those are not parts of the Mahabharata we normally identify with. So I would say the Mahabharata, in that sense, flows naturally into the Puranas. And, and there obviously was some cross filtration because neither the present text of the Mahabharata nor the present text of the Puranas is linear in sequence in the sense that this was frozen before that. It was a back and forth cross fertilization across the text, whatever they were. Okay, so we've been chatting away um, amongst uh, between us, so now we'll open up uh, the, the session to the audience for questions about the Puranas. Uh, hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, uh, where would you date the Puranas? Like, over what period of time were they written? Well, look, we can quibble a little bit here and there, but if we are talking about the Mahapuranas, 2nd century, 3rd century to 10th century, would you go along with that? I, the, the, well, I know that the Skanda Purana project, they say 5th or 6th or century. Well, no, I think they say 6th century, because actually what I didn't mention before is that there is, they've done some very beautiful work uh, identifying how the Purana was associated with King Harsha and produced at the court of King Harsha. So they're, they're looking at 6th yeah, century. He's asking across all of those what yeah. would be the range. So I well, said 2nd to 10th. Yeah, that, that sounds... I, I'm not sure that I would go quite as far back as 2nd. But okay, yeah, third. certainly up to 10th. But uh, as, as far as I'm aware, I mean, I think... Uh, and then they, they, But they keep getting uh, uh, added to. And I'm not sure what the... I, I wouldn't be surprised if even over the last century there's... Because often... Uh, uh, in my experience, particularly with these Mahatmyas and Stala Puranas, they will place uh, new texts that are composed are often then ascribed and said to be part of older Puranas. That's why it's so difficult to try and work out the, 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 uh, the oldest core of, of the so, text. So, so this, this response that I gave you is for the Mahapuranas, not for the others. There are versions of the Bhavishya Purana which have references to Queen Victoria. So obviously that cannot be 10th century. So the Mahapuranas, let's say third to ten. Hi. Uh, Hi. I would like to ask uh, regarding uh, the enormity of the text of the Puranas, don't you think a rewriting or uh, something else is required so that it is more accessible to the general people uh, and it, we can extract something out of it? Well, I think part of the reason I am here, it was not stated explicitly, but now that it's being asked, let me answer that. I translated the Mahabharata in 10 volumes, which I think Jim or Pushpesh mentioned, that those 10 volumes run into two and a quarter million words. After that, I've done the Harivangsha, which uh, is shorter, it's sometimes called a Purana, but it's not a classic Purana. I'm now doing the Valmiki Ramayana, which at least not from the publisher's point of view, from my point of view, it should be out of the way in another month's time. 
After that, I proposed to embark on this hazardous task of translating the 18 Mahapuranas, which together will, will run into 20 million words or thereabouts, unless in the intervening period I ascend upwards, which is likely to happen in the course of the Padma Purana or the Skanda Purana. But I'm beginning with the Bhagavad Purana, which should be out there for some time next year. Uh, so yes, in the context of your question, because people often do not know Sanskrit or do not, are not persuaded enough to read the material in the Sanskrit, and yes, Gita Press has done a phenomenal job, but if you are looking at something like Gita Press from a word-to-word -word kind of translation, it's not very accurate, it takes liberties. So yes, it is important to translate them. And that's the reason, as I said, that uh, I'm embarking on this hazardous task. Uh, I may add to this that uh, Vivek has already translated the, in five volumes the Puranas in an earlier incarnation. He's not happy, he wants to improve on that. But even that translation, which he doesn't think comes up to the mark, is in wonderful access for a person who can't either read Hindi or Sanskrit. And I think there are very helpful glosses, footnotes added. So all the scholarly work which he thinks has been wasted and he will exert again, I think is also very useful. I, let me I just uh, ask you a question as well on, 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 this, on this topic. Um, so the, the question asked, you know, how to make it more accessible. If, so if you're going to, you've already produced translation of the Puranas and you're going to produce a, a, a big one. But that is quite daunting, you know, it's a huge volume of, of, uh, of, uh, 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 of text. How, what would you suggest to someone wanting to, to get acquainted with the, with the Puranas? Where would they start? Because start, starting at the beginning is going to put most mean, people you, off. You, well, if it is the Hindi, I would still recommend Gita Press, despite what I said. Unless one is doing, it depends also at the level. Because even Amar Chitra Katha does that. So it entirely depends on the level. But Gita Press is probably still the best in Hindi. In English, if one is talking about an unabridged translation, Motilal Venarasi Das began to translate some of those. But the English is not particularly good or attractive. So I would not recommend the Motilal Benarasi Das ones because it would deter you from reading the Puranas. But um, there are retellings, not word for word exactly. Word for word, I think it's it's really the vernacular, not just the Hindi, not quite in English yet. Okay, thanks. So more questions. Uh, yeah, Jim. Lady at the... F Sorry. Oh, hey, Anupam, go for it. Uh, Mr. Debray, thank you for sharing your insights. Uh, my question is, uh, what was the purpose behind what was the purpose behind writing the Puranas because the Vedas, Mahabharata, Gita, Ramayana already existed? What more was it trying to provide? And secondly, in today's context, uh, why should why should we be reading it more than an academic interest on that time and you know the philosophy of the time? What is the context in today's today's world that we're living in for us to read the Puranas and learn from? Well, partly I answered the question when I responded to Pushpesh. Because there is Vedanta. Vedanta is not very difficult, is not very easy for the ordinary person to understand. So how do I convey the essence of that to people in communicable, comprehensible language? That was the intention behind Veda Vyas composing the Puranas and transmitting it through his disciples. The second part is either we say, I am going to ignore this legacy, this history and whatever, it doesn't matter to me, which is also a logical point of view. Alternatively, I recognize that legacy is there and then it is important for me to understand it. Let me give you an example of that. I won't give you the answer to that question. All the time, we are familiar with some mantra being chanted on somewhere or the other. Invariably, at the end of it, you will have an invocation to peace, which says, 
ओम शांति ही शांति ही शांति ही थ्राइस वाई नॉट सेवेंटीन टाइम्स वाई नॉट ट्वेंटी वन टाइम्स वाई इज इट थ्राइस आई दे यू डोंट आस्क द क्वेश्चन आई थिंक यू शुड आस्क द क्वेश्चन द आंसर टू दैट विल कम टू यू फ्रॉम द पुरानस आई विल नॉट गिव यू एन आंसर Uh, lady in the second row. Uh, Mr. Debra, I think you're a very brave man to take on this kind of a translation of Sanskrit. I was there at the session on Kalidas yesterday as well. I think it's an incredible uh, job that that you're trying to do. Um, what do you think, as a translator of uh, this whole Murti Classics edition that that's coming out, those uh, the the work that they have undertaken, as a translator? Uh, do you think that that would make those Sanskrit texts more accessible to uh, readers like us? Considering that most of us just know the Purans because we read the Chandi, if you're from the Shaiv Shak tradition or the Bhagavad Katha. Uh, you see, the way I look at it is the more the merrier. Whether it is Devdas doing it, whether it is Namita doing it, whether it's I doing it, whether it's the Murti series, anyone who's adding to that dissemination, I think, is good for the cause. What I would like is the next time someone from the eastern parts of perhaps all over India says something like. या देवी सर्वभूतेशु सृष्टि रूपेण संस्थिता नमस्तस्सई 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 नमो नमः द पर्सन नोस दैट लुक दिस इज फ्रॉम द मार्कंडेय पुराण एंड दिस वाज द कॉन्टेक्स्ट सो माय आंसर टू योर क्वेश्चन इज आई डोंट थिंक इट्स अ क्वेश्चन ऑफ हुज डूइंग अ बेटर जॉब और हुज डूइंग अ वर्स जॉब दैट्स नाइदर हियर नो देयर इट्स एन इरेलेवेंट क्वेश्चन द मोर पीपल डू इट इन इंग्लिश particularly because a large part of the population now is much more familiar with english than even with the vernacular earlier the translations existed in the vernacular but since there's been a switch the more people do this in english i think the better it is can i just ask will your translations be translated into vernaculars as well from english or or not i have absolutely no idea because i'm doing it only in the english I know, to the I know that in the case of the Mahabharata, someone wrote to me saying, "Do you have any problems if it is uh, done into Tamil?" I said, "I have absolutely no problems. I'll get in touch with Penguin and get you the permission." The last I heard, he was still struggling with these two and a quarter million words. So I have no idea what's happened to that. Okay, gentleman in the fourth row back there with his uh, hand up. it is an absolute pleasure to listen to a uh, international relation professor and an economist talking about puranas and sanskrit text uh, i would like to ask how you got into it because uh, we know that you are a very leading economist of the country how this bug caught you can i can i answer that for you there was a dog in the vedas that started it all <laughs> well two particular things happened at the same time by the way in all fairness i should say this that i learned sanskrit pretty late in life and i continuously regret the fact jim that i came to sanskrit at the age of 40 years or there about 35 years certainly and it's a great loss for me personally and i hope many of the young people who are here take to sanskrit early there were two triggers both of which happened at the same kind of time i have recounted this in the past but since you are asking let me state it again there was a professor of economics his name was professor ashok rudra who was extremely left wing marxist i'm talking about many years ago ashok rudra had a healthy contempt for my variety of economics and showed it i had a healthy contempt for his variety of economics except i did not show it 
So by mutual consent, we talked about everything else under the sun, including the Rama and Mahabharata, stuff like that. Ashok Rudra was not only an economist, he was also a statistician. So one day I casually told him, the Mahabharata says that the five Pandavas became accomplished in the use of five different kinds of weapons. Contrary to our perceptions, Yudhishthira was skilled in the use of the bow and arrow. Bhim, as everyone knows, in the Gada. So what happens if one sits down with the weapons that they usually actually used in the course of the war and does a statistical test? Most people would have said, crazy guy, get lost. Ashokrudra said, why don't you do it? So that's how I did one of the first papers. So this was... The first, the second event which more or less coincided in history was I chanced upon two shlokas. The first shloka is from the Valmiki Ramayan. It is from Kishkinda Kanda where Rama already knows that Sita is in Lanka and he is waiting to invade. He is waiting to invade Lanka. He is impatient. What is getting in the way? The monsoon is getting in the way. So he is waiting for the rains to be over. So the Valmiki describes the clouds. The clouds are tinged with lightning. There are Lightning is like flags on the clouds. And the clouds resemble elephants. And what are the elephants doing? The elephants are fighting. Vidyut Pataka Savala Kamala Shailendra Kuta Kriti Sannikasha Garjanti Megha Samudirna Nada Matta Gajendra Ivasan Yugastha. Crazy elephants fighting. I mentioned Kalidas yesterday. Kalidas, Megdutam, everyone knows the story. The Yaksha has been exiled. He is pining for his beloved. Kalidas is describing the clouds. And what do the clouds remind the yaksha of? Of elephants. But the yaksha is pining for his beloved and what are these elephants doing? The elephants are playing. Elephants use their tusks to dig up the earth. That's called vaprakirya. Asharasya prathama divase megam ashrishta sanum. The clouds are covering the mountains. Vaprakirya parinata gaja prekshaniyam dadash. So suddenly it hit me, two poets separated by time, by some centuries, it is impossible to date either, both of them talking about monsoon clouds, both of them have this imagery of elephants. In one case, Rama is impatient to fight, so the elephants are fighting. In the other case, the Yaksha is pining for his beloved, the elephants are playing. It was almost as if something suddenly hit me, and I thought if I do not read this, I am going to miss out on something in life. So these two incidents more or less coincided in time, and hence it started. Thanks. And how about you, Pushpesh? Well, I think, you know, I came to Sanskrit early in life. My mother had studied Sanskrit at Shanti Niketan. And there was a small piece of paper, uh, fading ink, written by her grandfather, who taught Sanskrit at BHU. It, it was said, Manya Maan Midam Vishwam Maya Rachita Matmani. Avidya Rajita Swapna Gandharva Nagaropamam. I don't know where the quote comes from. I was much too young, but my mother was fond of reading from this. And she said, look, you must learn to translate for yourself. And I think that was the beginning. And I, like him, regret very much that I did study Sanskrit uh, for my graduation, but that is stupid textbook, syllabus, and so on. So my mother forced me to go through Lagusiddhant Kaumudi and the traditional method. But then I thought Sanskrit was not useful. What was the use of doing it this day, this age? Branched off into contemporary history and international relations. Much to my regret, I came back when in my old age, I was going through Bharti Hari, Niti Shatak, Vairagya Shatak, and when you have Manoj Rama Taranga, Krishna Kula, all you see, Dik Tam Cha, Tam Cha Madanam Cha, Imam Cha, Maam Cha, Yam Cha, Intayami Sattam, Maisa Virakta. So then you suddenly realize that there is a very, very direct existential correlate which Sanskrit has. And I think it's like that Sanskrit is there and you are there and that is part of your culture. If you are not ac having access to Sanskrit, you are Prakrit. And nothing wrong with Prakrit, but then you are not civilized, so to speak. So I think you have Sanskrit 
and it opens up such vistas for you. Uh, yesterday there was a session here in this festival where Sur Sangeet Lata was being discussed and Mrinal was discussing with Vidya Shah and they were mentioning the word Swara. Swayameva Bhasati Iti Swara. Now what is the musical note which is radiant by itself? So the moment you have beginnings like this, you realize that what you are missing if you are not... And I think people like Rohini Bakshi who are opening up Sanskrit to people who had not had any exposure to Sanskrit. I think there's just no question if you can avoid Sanskrit. Thank you very much. Yes, um, Pushpesh just mentioned Rohini Bakshi there, who's actually an ex-student of mine. He's an excellent uh, communicator about the joys of Sanskrit. So those of you who are clued up with Twitter and Facebook and so forth, I recommend that you, you follow her. Uh, next can I, question. Can I just oh. add something to this? Uh, I, I, I want to just add to what Jim just said. And it's a phenomenal story, actually. About three years ago, maybe four years ago, someone introduced me to Rohini Bakshi, who Jim just made a reference to Rohini. And Rohini said, hey, Vivek, listen, I want to do something. I want to start Sanskrit lessons through Twitter. I said, what? Twitter, of all things, I can understand the net. Twitter. And believe it or not, this Sanskrit hour on Twitter has been a raging success. Amazing. Right now, sitting here, if I tweet in Sanskrit, there will be at least 50 people who will respond. So it's amazing the kind of interest that has developed in Sanskrit because of the alternative sources, alternative channels that has taken them away from the school kind of teaching which is a disastrous way of teaching Sanskrit. We had a question at the front here. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> what Vivek just said last was an exchange that I had with him, that Sanskrit was compulsory in school, and therefore one did it by rote and forgot what it meant. I also join you in regretting. Maybe the question to you is, uh, one question was already answered by you, uh, being a, a, a noted economist in India. Now, how are you going to, you know, how did you switch to so and so? But that question you've answered in depth. My second and uh, more pertinent question at this point is that you are working in Niti Aayog and in a very responsible leadership position of transforming in India with all the time and energy that you will be spending on some of these other things which are also very interesting, how would you think you'd be able to do justice to your job in Niti Ayo? You are suggesting without using the words that all of the stuff that I've been talking about right now is rather irresponsible. <laughs> let me, okay, let me give a response that uh, I don't always give, but now your question triggers me to give that response. There is a belief or there is a perception that I am doing this. I think that is absolute rubbish. It is being done by me. I said, don't look so skeptical. I said, I am merely the instrument. It is being done using me. I do not believe I am consciously doing this responsibly or irresponsibly. It is destiny that is driving me to do this. Let me give an example. I join to use your words, the responsible position in Niti. Before that, after doing the Mahabharata, I had been contemplating doing the translation of the Valmiki Ramayana. And I had given up all hope because believe it or not, Jim, it is almost impossible to get a copy of that critical text from Varoda. I had been trying for eight years, gave up. Simply not available. Just wasn't available. I used all the resources at my command, including the then CM's office in Gujarat. I couldn't get a cent. 
I told my wife who's seated next to you, forget it, Valmiki Ramayan is not going to happen. Pradeep Mehta has said you got a responsible job in Niti Aayog, now Valmiki Ramayan is a dis digression, you can't do it. I was traveling on a flight, right next to me on a flight I find a gentleman whom I did not know at that point. After a while I discovered he was reading something in Sanskrit, he discovered I was reading something in Sanskrit. The probability these days of a single person reading something in Sanskrit on a plane is very low. Two people next to each other reading something in Sanskrit is pretty close to zero. So we are both very intrigued. We looked at each other, we introduced ourselves and lo and behold, this is Shailendra Mehta, whom I had heard of but I never met him. So Shailendra said, ah, Vivek, Mahabharata out of the way, now what? I said, Valmiki Ramayana is not going to happen, Niti Ayog, can't get the text. Four months later, Shailendra rings me up. Vivek, are you in office? I said, yes, I am. I'm coming over. In walks Shailendra with a trolley bag. Shailendra has traveled to different parts of India. From seven different parts of India, he has picked up copies of this critical edition, gives it to me and says, all yours, only condition is, after this is over, you have to donate it to the IIC library. I said, I. I told my wife, if this is not destiny, please tell me what is destiny. If this does not mean that I have to translate the Valmiki Ramayana, I do not know what can be a better signal. A gentleman in the glasses in the fifth row back. Uh, it was uh, a great pleasure to hear that you learned Sanskrit at 40. I am sure there are many amongst us here who would want to learn Sanskrit. So, uh, can you tell us how you did it? Uh, what, how long it took you? to be reasonably proficient, to understand the text uh, without uh, going to glossaries and all that. And uh, what is the best way for uh, an old man, not a young man, to try and learn Sanskrit and uh, enjoy it before he dies? Well, look, there are two questions which seem to be related questions, but they are different questions. Because the way I learnt it is not necessarily the most efficient way to learn Sanskrit. Why? Because how do you normally learn a language? First you learn to speak it, then you learn to read it, and then you write, learn to write it, if at all, for some language like Sanskrit. But I am self-taught, I did not attend any course or anything like that, so my learning was actually reversed. I learned to read first because that was my motivation. Thereafter, I learned to speak. The trouble with learning Sanskrit is it is badly taught, as I said. It has been reduced to mugging up grammar tables. Sanskrit is inherently a very logical language if you can understand the logic, you don't need to mug up anything. Except the trouble is, it's a chicken and egg kind of problem. You begin to appreciate it only after you've learnt a fair bit of Sanskrit and then you realize, I need not have mugged up the tables. How do we normally learn a language? We speak it. Any language, we speak it, we converse in it, we make mistakes and then we are corrected and that's how we learn a language. You don't learn a language by Mugging up, nara, nara, nara. that's not how you learn a language. So I think the best way to learn a language is to attend a conversational class. Particularly I'd recommend one that I know of, but there will be several others, the ones that are run by Sanskrit Bharati. Depending on which city you are in, at the end of 10 days, you will begin to converse in Sanskrit. And then it's up to you to take it forward. There are uh, DVDs, there are uh, net-based Chitrapur Mutt lessons are extremely good. So it actually is a function of what you want to do, whether you have the time to enroll in something that is structured, even if it is for 10 days, or whether you want to make it completely self-taught. My only suggestion is, please stay away from the structured kind of things, because they will murder your interest in Sanskrit. I'll just add something briefly to that, which I totally agree with. Also, I think that 
coming back to our panel, that the Puranas would be a lot, you know, when you do want to start reading texts, actually they're written in very simple Sanskrit uh, about subjects that most people know all about already. So it's not like trying to read some difficult, abstruse piece of Shankara or something. I, th I think they'd be a, a great place to start. Um, yeah, actually, actually, you see, Shankara, you said Shankaracharya, you referred to Shankaracharya. You see, Shankaracharya was a great teacher, and the reason I'm saying that is he, he judged the level of the student and accordingly uh, taught some of the Shankaracharya stotras, which we know by heart often. If you just try to understand them, that's a pretty good way to begin to learn Sanskrit. I think Bhajgovinda Murmati is an excellent example of that. Dhan Javan Ka Garab Ne Kije from a film song to a straight sutra to a mere shayari. It relates straight away. And I think to begin with, I think Rohini Bakshi's Sanskrit Appreciation Hour, I would wholeheartedly recommend to anybody who wants to enjoy Sanskrit. You can go to the Twitter, go to the I, I, I mean, next time, Vakratunda Mahakaya Surya Koti Samaprabha, just try to understand it and that's a pretty good way to start. Gita, Nahanete Hanyamane Sharire, you might come back from Maitri Devi's autobiography and the Nahanete Hanyamane would be there as well. Okay, apparently that, uh, time's up, I'm afraid. We've got time for no more questions. So uh, it just remains for me to, to thank very much our uh, two, two, uh, two authors here, Pushpesh Pant and Vivek Debroy. Thank you very much. Debroy, Pushpesh, Pant, and Jim Mallinson. This session was sponsored by Dainik Bhaskar Bhasha series.